Okay, I hope you put some thought into that question for your bell work. And I showed you two pictures to help you think about how these two, if you know what they mean, we know a little bit what they mean, right? Um, how they can be related. So, and um, you're also going to notice that your notes look a little bit different than they normally do. There's no slide one, slide two, slide three, um, but it is an order starting with that chart on the top, which you will fill in while we're going through the notes. And you just continue to follow through and then flip the page over. They're very short today. And these are the last notes we have for this unit. Okay. So, so you have this again. Here's the first one filled out for you. So the types of relationships, the description, very brief description, and then the example, uh, one example is fine. Okay, so if you can come up with one example and you understand what that means. Um, we've covered this part a little bit already, so we're not gonna spend too much time on this. And the notes are only 25 slides long, so 22 at this point. Okay, so types of symbiosis. When one species, and we know that that's when one species lives in a close relationship with another species. And mutualism is the first one, already filled out on your chart for you. Here are some examples. Um, mutualism was when both species benefit from the relationship. So bees and flowers, uh, clownfish and sea anemones, and ants and aphids. Parasitism, we talked about tapeworms already. Um, so we've got fleas and ticks and lice and a strangler fig. These trees grow all over this area. If you see a tree, like a palm tree typically, surrounded by roots and tr that will eventually become a trunk, this is a strangler fig. The birds eat the seeds and they drop them places and the seeds grow and then they take over the plant that they're on and parasitize it. And that's of course, one is benefited, the other one is um, harmed, okay? One is benefited, the other is harmed. We had, we talked about this already, this is just some more examples, okay? And commensalism, one species benefits, and the other one is neither benefited nor harmed. So cattle egrets following cows around, the cattle egrets are 50% more successful in catching bugs when the cows are there because the cows scare the bugs up out of their hiding places and the egrets just eat the bugs. Um, and then barnacles on a, on a right whale, for example, or a gray whale, in that case. Barnacles just get along, get a free ride, but they don't hurt the animal. And then the last one, you notice that there's a last relationship in that box, in that chart uh, on your page, and that's the predator-prey relationship, where one organism feeds on another. For example, carnivore uh, is a meat eater, including humans, right? So here we've got a snake eating a frog, an alligator eating a crab, lions and zebras and bears and fish and uh, hawks and birds, hawks and snakes, spiders and insects, humans and cows, sharks and everything, <laughs> anything you can eat. <clears throat> so what's biodiversity? So we're going to move on to biodiversity, something a little bit uh, newer than the symbiosis that we discussed already. So this is degree of variation of life forms within a given ecosystem, biome, or entire planet. In other words, how many organisms, plants and animals, live in a particular area, okay? And the greater the diversity, the more chances of survival. More biodiversity means a healthier food web and more available resources for all the organisms involved. And this is just an, you know, not really scientific, but the world is more beautiful because of biological diversity. And so here we have a, a great diversity in a coral reef, and here we have a great diversity in a rainforest. So you, you can have that in more than one place. 
Now there are threats to biodiversity. Okay, so we're in the middle of the first page. Catastrophic events like fire, flood, storms, and climate change. Human activities, building. Um, oh, there's no building here, but there will be. Uh, so deforestation is an example, okay? Overplanting, um, and then of course, invasive and introduced species. We'll talk about these uh, later today. So what is an invasive or introduced species? Hey, it's later already. <laughs> an organism found in a place it doesn't naturally belong. It was introduced to a new area, and then there are ecological repercussions because of that introduction. So here are two famous examples. Um, this one, we live, we live with both of these all day. You guys probably don't notice the European starling. It's been here for 122 years in the United States, North America. Whereas the iguanas have only come and have been spreading in the past 15, 20 years-ish, okay? Um, and sometimes they're released on accident. For example, the lionfish that you saw on the last page, that was a, a slide. That was a hurricane that overflowed the tanks down in Miami and the fish got out and spilled out into the salt water and then spread prolifically into the environment. Sometimes on purpose, European starlings and iguanas. Pets that people no, the iguanas were pets that people no longer wanted to take care of. They didn't want to kill it, so they let it go into the wild. And of course, someone five blocks down did as well, and the male and female met, and then the babies, and then other people did. It, it, yeah, that's the way it happened. And now they're everywhere. And the European starlings were introduced by a fan of William Shakespeare. So in 1900, in New York City, in Central Park, he wanted, this person wanted to introduce every bird species in every Shakespeare play to the United States. And so he went to Europe and collected a uh, hundred European starlings, brought them over on a ship and let them all go in Central Park. And now they're everywhere. And both of these species are uh, dangerous, destructive to the environment because they don't have natural predators or too many. Uh, from where, like from where they're come or other controls. They eat birds' eggs and take over uh, nesting owl burrows and destroy gardens and take over other nesting areas for native birds. So that's why they are considered invasive and nuisance animals. Florida is second only to Hawaii for number of invasive species. There are over 500 invasive species in Florida, and here is just a sprinkling of about a quarter of them, okay? Everything from the wild hogs, I know they're so cute, but they don't belong here and they're very destructive, to something called citrus canker, which attacks our citrus trees and plants, okay? To uh, people from New Jersey. That's a joke. I'm from New York, so I can say that. Um, tilapia. Hydrilla is a plant that grows in fresh water. These eels, um, Asian swamp eel, so many. Fire ants are invasive from South America. Plants and animals and fish and birds, they're everywhere. Even feral cats are destroying the, um, not, you know, feral cats are like domestic cats that are wild and they're not, they're outside and no one really takes care of them. They kill all the songbirds. So what is extinction? Back page, page two. Everyone should have their page flipped over right now. Extinction, the dying out or termination of a species. So here with the white rhino, uh, the woolly mammoth, and the dodo bird are examples, recent examples. Last, you know, 10,000 years, a couple hundred years ago, in, you know, the last, this century. So a non-renewable resource is one that is not replaceable. 
Fossil fuels are not replaceable. Ores like aluminum ore, which is called bauxite. Minerals, iron ore, gold, gemstones, copper ore. These are non-renewable, meaning that if I take them all, there will be none left. Non-renewable, they don't renew, okay? If I took all the gold in the world and I put it here, it would be as big as the school, probably. I don't know how big it would be, but, and, that, and then there'd be none left anywhere else in the world, okay? Um, yeah, and the opposite of that is the renewable resource. And by using renewable resources and using our non-renewable resources carefully and recycling them, um, because they are, you can't make new ones, so they have to be recycled, we can help our planet ecologically and uh, you know, make biodiversity a priority. Okay, because if we keep taking and keep taking and keep polluting and keep polluting, biodiversity goes down and then the whole e ecological system breaks down, right? That's why we're talking about this stuff. So, can be replaced by natural processes. So, sunlight, you got over a billion years left of that. Plenty to last, go around. Water power, destructive when done poorly to the environment, um, but it can be done well, okay? And then, uh, this is the Hoover Dam, that was, that was made in the 19... 20th century, beginning of the 20th century, so practically, you know, 100 years ago. Um, might as well be. And then air, of course, wind, wind power. But there are also ecological problems with that. The blades um, kill birds, and they do need to be replaced once in a while. So there's like a pollution problem with the blades, so they have to make them that they're sustainable and recyclable and stuff like that. Now, speaking of sustainability, what does sustainability mean? So, all of this stuff is, like, like I said before, working to keep that biodiversity. In order to do that, we have to maintain essential functions and processes and retain the biodiversity in full measure. That's what sustainability means. But it's a, it, it's a fine balance between three things. The environment, very important. Society and the growth of society or the maintenance of society, roads, infrastructure, airports, schools, housing, recreation areas, you know, all that. The needs for the people, food, and then money. Because money, unfortunately, drives virtually all of this. So, over the long term, how is it possible to balance all three of these? And that's what, that's what sustainability is. Because if you don't have sustainability, then things, systems break down. And then eventually, the, the earth will be too polluted or people will starve. And we no longer can sustain life on, on earth. Okay, and the last thing we're going to talk about is ecological succession. And this has a lot to do with what we're talking about because if we allow this to happen in places that have been negatively affected by man, by humans, we can start gaining some of that sustainability back again, okay? So this is over time, communities develop into mature communities from where there wasn't a community before, or a very weak community, a very low biodiversity to a high biodiversity. That's what ecological succession means. So this picture is an example of where you're starting from bare rock. Now this could be from a volcano, fire, uh, building, you know, a building taken down and left bare, 
you know, on the ground. You're going to get some grasses and weeds moving in, then small bushes, then large shrubs, then young trees, then a mature forest. And then if you're focused on a certain area, you can harvest some of those trees without destroying the whole forest. So this would be bad. Taking all the trees, but if you take some and then you plant more, and then you come back the next year and take some and then plant more, you have a sustainable forest that you're harvesting from, but you're not wiping out. See the difference? So when can succession happen? And I talked about a little bit about it before, but here are some more specific examples. So we've got natural and human. Natural disasters, fire, floods, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions. So a flood comes in and kills all the plants, or saltwater flood, tsunami comes in, the salt water kills all the freshwater loving plants, and so now you've got empty land, okay? Fire comes through, some fires are good because they wipe, they clean out the underbrush and leave the trees alive. Other fires are too strong and they destroy everything. Volcano, of course, would destroy everything. Um, earthquakes, uh, landslide, wiping out a whole area. And then human activities like mining. We have a lot of phosphate mining in Florida that pretty much turns the entire surface of the, of the area into something called a moonscape. There's nothing alive anymore. It's just all dirt and rocks. Logging, building and farming, okay? Building these communities that almost all of us live in, right? So how does succession occur? You've got this barren land now, either created by man or by nature. How does, what are the steps that bring plants and animals back into the, the community so that biodiversity can grow? So primary succession is when a community comes from where none existed before, like volcanic devastation or fire, the soil has been damaged. You're at a point where a new island, for example, comes up out of the ocean because of a volcano, and you've got this barren land. How does life start there? That's primary, primary first, first life succession, okay? So you've got pioneer organisms. So here's the damage, volcano or fire, bare soil. So pioneer species like lichens, we talked about lichens and how they are a symbiotic relationship, mutualistic between a fungus and an algae, right? And we can see them right outside if you walked outside. Um, mosses and other things move in and they literally break the rock down into soil so that other seeds from grasses and weeds and trees can blow in and then insects move in and it just starts the whole process over again. Same thing here, and then eventually you get shrubs and other things moving in, all right? Pioneer organisms moving into bare dirt. And then at the end, you get this thing called a climax community. A climax community is at the, at, after the end of succession, has, you get this old growth that has been here for hundreds of years. Um, this is Saguaro National Forest out west in, I believe, Arizona, south southern Arizona. I've been there. This is a beautiful road. You can drive very narrow, very winding road that you can drive through the whole thing and just look at it all. You can get out if you want to. Took some beautiful sunset pictures there. And then um, this is the giant uh, redwoods in California that have been there for thousands of years. These, are, these, uh, these cacti are hundreds of years old. They say that every arm coming out of a saguaro cactus is indicative of another, of a hundred years. So some of these cacti are three, four, five hundred years old. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's stable. It's a stable community that maintains diversity, biodiversity, mature forest, okay? And then something called, if there's primary succession, there must be something called secondary succession, right? So, and then this is when the soil has not been destroyed, okay? So examples would be a vacant city lot where uh, there was maybe uh, a building there with, you know, maybe trees around it or, you know, some grass. 
but the building was taken out, and so um, there was no no fire or anything like that. And a farm, an old farm, like an abandoned cornfield, like here, abandoned cornfield, a forest that was logged, and then new growth will come back. So this is the actual same field um, after one, two, three, uh, plus, and five years plus. So you start to see shrubs and small trees growing, and then eventually, this is not the same one. I found this elsewhere, but eventually you, that will turn into a mature forest after about, these trees are about 25, 30 years old. So you can tell by the diameter of the trunk. And um, that's, that's your notes, but this is really cool. So pay attention to this example. Um, this occurred when I was 10 years old, okay? Um, well, I was seven years old when this picture was taken, but three years later, something happened to Mount St. Helens in the state of Washington. So, I mean, beautiful mountain, dormant volcano, forest and trees all around, a lake was there, I mean, it was, and then this. May 18th, 1980. The entire side of the mountain blew off. There was no lava. It was just what's called a pyroclastic explosion or, or eruption, okay? Pyroclastic means, um, pyro means fire or hot, okay? And um, so this is just hot ash and rocks and moving at eventually a thousand miles per hour down slope. You see the whole thing blowing up, all moving down here. The entire side of the mountain just blows up and it wipes the forest clean. Just gone. Everything dead. Okay. But this is three years after. And so you can see some flowers, which some people would call weeds, you know, uh, wildflowers and other plants starting to grow back because seeds blow in and you've got so the same area, same exact picture. You see the log, big log, look. Okay, that's that big tree right there, still there. Um, in 1995, you've got small trees, young trees, some older trees actually, and 1999, same exact spot. See the tree? And how much bigger it got, this one? Okay, and so this is a perfect example of um, succession happening after a natural event. And then 2004, this is 2004. This is uh, a little bit later, different, different area, different log. Um, but this is just, you know, 12 years ago or so. No, not 12. 20, 18 years ago. Yeah, sorry. Can't do my math. And then this is just another example of where the, where the hot pyroclastic flow killed everything. And then about 20 years later, we get that. So from Mount St. Helens. Really neat. And that's our notes, so make sure you turn this in today.